Unfortunately, I need to start this evening on a, a sad note. It's a eulogy for an old friend, a very important tree that grew in Seaview Farm. It's a eulogy for a painkiller tree. Keith Lynn Smith's, Sir Keith Lynn Smith's book, To Shoot Hard Labor, tells us uh, the life story of his grandfather, uh, Papa Sammy. And Papa Sammy took the time out to describe medicinal uses of various plants, including the famous painkiller tree at North Sound. Anybody know the painkiller tree at North Sound? Raise your hand. Yeah. Right? Okay. It's uh, standing by the side of the road, and famously, you take a leaf from the tree. I get a leaf. Famously, you take a leaf from the tree, and you heat the leaf till it gets nice and soft, or you can roll it with a rolling pin or in the old days, a rum bottle. It gets flexible, the juices are coming out. You can put on some castor oil, and then you bind it to your hand or to the aching, another aching part of your body, like your head. And, um, and it's supposed to cure pain. But in return, in return for taking the leaf of the tree, you're supposed to pay the painkiller tree. You do that by hammering a tenpenny nail into the trunk of the tree, or to hammer a coin, like a sixpence, edgewise into the trunk of the tree. Now, um, the archaeologist, Dr. Reginald Walter, and I went up to the tree with a metal detector. And as we approached, the metal detector started to scream. Reg said, 100% metal. <laughs> so that tree, that tree is just about still standing. A beautiful tree, a special tree which is very rare on Antigua. It's a tree from the Pacific, Barringtonia Asiatica, a sea poison tree. The leaves are used in the Pacific Ocean. Drop them in the sea and the fish the fish come up. The fishermen drop them in the sea and they come up. Um, now, I asked Keith Lynn Smith, are there any more of those trees in Antigua? And he said, government cut all of those evergreens down. Cut them down. I went all around Antigua in the early 2000s asking, asking, asking about these trees. Eventually, to my surprise, there was one in Seaview Farm. Some uh, mechanic said to me, Yes, just go there, past Miss O'Reilly's house. They're just, just there. Yeah, you see the stinking toe tree? Just be, be on the stinking toe. Got there, and there was another tree with nails in it. And guess what? The villagers knew how to use that tree as well. And that's, here's the sad point. A year ago, I took Sir Keith Lynn to look for that tree, and it was gone. Not a trace. I bring you a leaf from a related tree, but that painkiller tree is gone. And then, early this year, another sad story. A former member of the Cultural uh, Ministry of Culture told me that there had been an, a third painkiller tree in Fibre, right here in town. It was the same type of painkiller tree as the one cut down in Seaview Farm, we think, but we'll never know for sure, because it's gone. When Fibre was being moved, the Ministry of Culture tried, made every effort to preserve that tree. Mitzi Buckley and a photographer working for the museum took some pictures of the old houses of Fibre. And then there's one very sad tree, picture of a large tree lying on its side and a raster man on top of the tree. And the caption is, gone. That tree was in the exact spot that we needed it to be. Cruise ships come in, it's right there. School children come to town, it's right there. And it's gone now. Now the painkiller tree of Papa Sammy out in uh, North Sound is on the threat Somebody's already tried to cut off a limb. It's gone. Limb is gone. Honeybees have gone inside it. So now you can't hammer a tenpenny nail into it. 
right? Or you will get a ten penny nail back. Right? And um, and so I, I I decided to preface this talk with a call to the people of Antigua. Let us count and know our heritage trees, a connection that we have with our ancestors, and a, 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 a heritage of immense val value for the future. This year at Carifesta, the, the topic is intangible heritage. Yes, we have a tree, but the belief that surrounds it is only in people's heads, only in memory, and then the, the tree is gone, that memory will fade. It's the decade of the people uh, of, of African descent. Let us take this time to gather together the knowledge of our ancestors from Africa. Give it the value that we give to those of our ancestors from Europe and then see what we can do with it. You know? And the type of thing that I'm going to talk about as we continue. Um, you know, I've, I asked can the, there be representatives from the Calypsonians here? Can there be representatives from the artists and the dancers here? Carnival costumes have been reduced to bikini and feathers. No, I'm not complaining. But we can, we can dig back into the treasure chest and be inspired again. In Barbados, the famous Calypsonian, uh, Dr. Gabby, was incensed when somebody tried to close a beach to him, close a beach to the people of Barbados. And how did he illustrate his anger? He, sa he sang, my navel string buried here. I'm saying, let us preserve our traditions, re-educate the, 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 the children, pass them from generation to generation, let them live so that they're there for inspiration, for art, for manufacture, for performance, okay? Let's continue, right, with that. So, welcome everybody, right? Glad to have you here, and um, thank you very much to the Ministry of, let me get it right, Sports, Culture, National Festival, and the Arts. I'm especially um, grateful to Mr. Lodat, because when we met last year and started asking questions about that missing fibery painkiller, he asked me to come up and, 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 and say some words uh, about our tree heritage for, for African History Month. Okay? And uh, what we decided to do was to just run through a number of plants that we have, a number of traditions that we have, and rather than have an academic paper here tonight about how, 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 how strong is the evidence pointing to one place or not? We'll just have some fun. We'll see what you remember, what I remember. We'll look at some of these plants and we'll ask questions, okay? Also want to thank our collaborators, the Museum of Antigua and Barbuda, for having us here. And here we have Hammer Productions, who have volunteered to record the whole session. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture, provided many of those plants. And look at that beautiful wrapping done by Miss Brown and Miss Peters of the Ministry of Culture. I just want to thank them very much. Right? Okay, I'm gonna reverse the topic. The topic was, can our bush medicine traditions guide us towards our African origins? Don't really have time for that, right? Bush medicine, bush doctors, is a shorthand for ethnobotany, right? For knowledge of the plants and animals. But if I said, come and hear a, 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 a talk about botany, nobody would come. So, so our bush medicine traditions. And can it guide us to our African traditions? What I'm going to do to, to, to be able to cover the material that I want to is just start in Africa, right? And, 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 and dash between the Caribbean and Africa sometimes. So, First group of people that I want to talk to you about um, are the Ashanti. The Ashanti people in Africa, they're in the west coast of Africa, they're in Ghana. Right? Now, they seem to be very important to our heritage. Anybody know any words that we might have got from the Ashanti? Um, Fungi. Fungi is from the Congo, and we'll come to them next. Right? Yes. 
right? Possibly. Any other ideas? Nyam. Nyam. Now, Nyam is a good word. Nyam comes from the Kikongo, from the Ashanti, and many other African people. Yeah, Nyam is not bad at all, right? Nyam and Yam, Yam, right? In East Africa, for example, where my wife comes from, um, Nyama means meat. And here in Antigua, one of our words for to eat is what? Ninyam. Yeah, ninyam. Okay. So several different cultures have that word. Right? The Ashanti are really important to us. I, I sometimes say that I can be Ashanti the whole day if I want to. When I wake up, I take nyampi out of my eye. That's an Ashanti word. Right? I can drink some nunubazam. Right? Or I can drink some manpiaba a woman piaba. Right? Pia is an Ashanti word for a particular plant, and ba means little bush. Okay? Another name for man piaba is Lord Lavington. And unfortunately, we don't have so any of it with us today. Um, then, I can cook in my yaba, I can eat dukana, or I can eat conkeys. Right? Ashanti words there. When I go outside to work, I can um, gossip, konkonsa, and you know, konkonsa worse than obia, right? <laughs> right? Obia might well be from the Ashanti, though there's, it's debated in uh, Akan languages like Ashanti. Um, the word obaye means sorcery, and an obaye fo is a sorcerer, okay? So, um, and we can go on like this. Um, uh, I wanted to show you some of the plants that we have, which seem to have names related to the Ashanti people. Let's see. OK. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a garden pest. You, do you know it? Rabbit food, right? Um, it runs and runs, and what do you know about it? What do you call it? French weed. French weed, okay. Some people say pond weed and so on. Um, one, one time I said, you know, this looks interesting. Let me chop it up, right, and try to use it as a compost. Mistake. <laughs> this doesn't compost. This never dies, right? It took over the garden. An ambassador... Uh, came from Ghana and was in Guyana. And he, he, um, he saw this plant and he asked the Guyanese, what's the name of that plant? And the Guyanese said, God na dead, me na dead. Right? And the, the ambassador was shocked because that is a direct translation of the Ashanti name. Right? If God doesn't die, we can't die. Okay? That's one. This little sweetheart, anybody? It's not wild tamarind. See the root? Yeah. Seed on the leaf, okay? Because if you look closely, you will see little um, objects underneath the leaves, okay? Now, um, the Jamaicans call it pikni muma, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the Ashanti say, she carries her children on her back. Okay, seed on the leaf and pick the mama. Now, when a lady is having difficulty in childbirth in a shanty, this will be one of the bushes that they will give her to ease the labor. They might also give her um, internally and in, in, the, um, in the vagina some slippery substances like okros. Right, or uh, sesame seed boiled up, okay? So this, um, this is one of the plants that's supposed to help. And then another name for it in Antigua is children bush, right? Children bush. You go into sweets or so on, and they will say that this can be used for the, the common cold with children, okay? Our, our focus will not be on the medicinal uses, right? The focus will be sometimes on the uses, but on... Um, and, and then any of the traditions, including uses, which connect it to um, its, its uh, heritage 
heritage uh, uses in, 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 in the old world if, if they exist. Okay. Um, we have several others. Um, can anybody help me with this one? Who said Corilla, please? Corilla, one word. Yes, another one? Foul batty. Right? Okay. Okay. Another one? Maiden blush. Yes. Any more? Jamaicans? Circe, Circe Bush, Circe Bush in Barbados. Right? Now, where did that, these names come from? Um, anybody else from Antigua? Bitter Bush, yes. Um, could be, but not, my, not to my knowledge. What do you do with this, folks? Yes, and what do children call it? Inside? Lizard food, okay? Lo and behold, right, a number of people in West Africa right, call this the food of the snake, or the food of the toad, or the food of the lizard. Okay? Right. Now, um, in putting together books like the Dictionary of Caribbean English, they like to say where they think uh, a word comes from. You know? They say, Conky, Barbados, from Kenke, Ghana, and so on. Um, but they could not find any origins for the word Cerasi. Barbadians say Cerasi. Jamaicans say Cerasi, Haitians say Asosi, right? And this plant is just about the most popular and widely known medicinal plant in the African world. Here in the Caribbean, down in South America, Caribbean to Cuba, Cubans in, in, in Florida, uh, Caribbean people in New York, everybody wants some of this. Right? Barbadians have another name for it, the miraculous bush. Circe bush, it can be used uh, to, promote, um, to promote menstruation, therefore maiden blush. Okay. A little more, it can pro promote abortion. Right? That's maidens not blushing. <laughs> right. um, the the um, plant can be used on the skin, right? It's supposed to in, 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 in improve skin texture and appearance. Um, some people say that if you uh, wash children in it or if you drink it when you're pregnant, that the children have nicer skin. I don't know if that's true. There are many, many beliefs about the magical powers of Circe and, um, and the other names. As I said, Barbadians call it Miraculous Bush and there are some beliefs that if you wash in it, you can wash away bad luck. A friend told me that when she was a child in St. Vincent, she had a botheration cousin. Child was very difficult. And when the grandmother came, the grandmother would make a point of stripping him down to his underwear, putting him in a bath, grinding up this bush, which the St. Vincentians called Corilla, the Indian name, Corilla and then washing the child from head downwards with this green water, using this as a sponge, sup, 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 supping him from head to toe. This is also done in Jamaica. Cerise in rum as well is supposed to um, drive away spirits or in some, in some um, rituals um, with Afro-Jamaican -Jama religions is supposed to attract the spirits. Um, so it has an immense reputation. I was curious as to why that may be. And then I started to understand that in Ghana, the Ashanti bury their kings wrapped up in Circe bush. That the queens wear necklaces of Cer Circe to show that they are mourning. The um, other peoples in Ghana wear it as a, a, a wreath of office, the Ga people, 
and sometimes the fantasy warriors wear a garland of Cersei bush in their in their hair, right? Um, they call it nyanya. Could not find that word anywhere in the Caribbean except one mention in a part of Jamaica. It's in the dictionary of Jamaican English as Ghana, and it could it could be nyanya. It could not. Then one day, good fortune struck, and we found Cersei. Not among the Ashanti, but among the neighbor, neighboring people, the Ewe of Togo and Benin. The Ifan and Ewe, Togo of Benin, are uh, also among our, our ancestors. And they famously uh, contributed to uh, the, the Vodou religion over there. They call God and the Spirits Vodou. Right? And that uh, inspired our Caribbean version of the Vodou religion. And they call this, this plant Asosiken. Asosiken, which means Cersei vine. Ken is vine. And um, we presented that in a, in a conference this year. And uh, we, we're going to publish it soon. In that area, you see the priests go topless into the forest once a year, wearing their garlands of Cersei. And they try to discover a mystical stone, and the color of that stone on that particular day, that stone shines, and the color will tell you whether it's going to be a good year, terrible year, medium year, wealthy year. And uh, so um, you, if you look online, you can see them bringing the stone out and the stone shining blue for a good year. Now, one year, people, people noticed that the stone was shining in the colors of the political party in government. <laughs> it was very suspicious. So a lot of people started to make Instagram posts. You know, everybody was coming out with their own stone. You know, you could see one guy has garland of of uh, Cersei on. You know, and he was carrying a concrete brick. <laughs> everybody was laughing at the priests. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very funny. Um, so that's a little bit about the Ashanti and. Um, this time is, is, is drifting along. Um, I want to see what else I want to say. Oh, what else I want to say about them. Here's a speculation. My inquiries show that this is not the only plant that they wear as garlands. Right? Sometimes they, they wear this. Right? This is a relative of the passion fruit. It's a little wet. You want to see it? This is called pop bush. Inside it has a, a nice green fruit here. If you. Okay. You can get it to pop. And um, walking behind the big church, the, the cathedral, many years ago, I noticed a woman wearing it around her waist. Um, actually, no. She was carrying it, said, what's that for? She said, I'm pregnant, and I'm going to wear it around her waist, my waist. Right? And that was the first I knew of people wearing vines like this around their waist. I found out that in some of the islands, Jamaica, St. Vincent, the British Virgin Islands, people will wear Circe around the neck for uh, neck pain and, um, and also sometimes to for sore throat while they drink Cersei bush. They will also have it around the neck. Who knows? Is it aromatherapy? I don't know. Right? But um, I noticed a pattern in the plants that they had been using in Ghana. The names for this and a couple of other plants that they're wearing also sound like pop, pop. Okay? As we call it, pop bush. So we, may, we may have got it directly from them or we may have reinvented the name. Right? And um, each of these plants has a curious vine shape with a tear-shaped fruit hanging down from it or something to pop. This can pop as well. Oh, it's already popped, unfortunately. And um, I wondered, let's see, they bury in these vines and we bury in the, with this vine. Now, this vine is not a native to the islands, right? But 
what role does this play at funerals? Yes, absolutely. We put the coffin into the ground and then, right, gentlemen in their suits walk around the cemetery gathering up the um, Coralita. Yes, Coralita. I can remember big bundles of Coralita throwing them in. These days, it comes ready-made. Uh, for a couple of dollars, the, um, the grave diggers um, have it ready at the side or next to it a bag of, um, of shredded paper right from the office and everybody throws it in. In Barbados, they've taken it a step further because Barbadians do. And uh, um, the shredded paper is sewed into a nice six foot long cushion in white or purple or green or another liturgical color. And that is called the bed and it's tied onto the top of the coffin and lowered into the grave, the wreaths go on top. Isn't that interesting? So we've taken a car an idea that may, may have come from somewhere else and we, we've um, elaborated on it. I have no idea whether there's any connection here, but I did see one reference where um, an Englishman visiting Barbados was watching the Africans being buried near his home and they were saying, when you go back to Africa, say hello to this person for me and say hello to that person for me. Then he commented on how much care those enslaved people gave to their dead. And he said, I saw them lower the soil on a rope in a basket so that it wouldn't land on top of the body. And I wish that we had such respect for our dead in England. Okay, so some seems to be some sort of general tradition that um, soil should not land on the body uh, in, in, um, in many parts of Africa, including Ghana. A niche is, 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 is dug in the side of the shaft. So you dig down and then you dig a little pocket and that's where the body is, is put wrapped up in cloth. And then you fill in so that soil doesn't land on it. So it's a bit of a stretch, and I can't say that there's any connection. Okay. We may return to the Ashanti, but um, I wanted to, to talk about another tradition um, before we leave the Ashanti. Just one last one. Any know, anybody know this plant? Names, please. Pissabed. Pissabed. What else? Pissabed, right? Now, this plant in Antigua is called Pissabed. And I've never got a, a straight answer as to why it's called Pissabed. Right? Well, you can drink it to stop the children from peeing the bed. You can put it under the blanket so that it rustles or scratches them so that they wake up and go and pee, right? We used to use it to scrub the floor with long grass. And if you pee the floor, you can use it to take out the smell out of the floor. You know, all of those, or, or, or none of them can be, um, can be true. Right? I haven't done the numbers to find out which ones are the most common uses. But I've never been able to be satisfied with the name. So I started doing some digging. Lo and behold, um, the name Pissabed describes another daisy in England. Right? Another plant which looks like the sun, a daisy. And when you drink it, you pee more, <laughs> right? right. Um, the French call the same plant piss on lit, right? Because L-I-T, lit, is the French for bed, piss on lit, okay? And, um, and uh, this, this is going to get complicated now. 
there is a there is a masquerade in Trinidad called Pison Lee. Right? Now Pison Lee was such a disgusting, nasty, worthless masquerade that the government eventually, after many years, managed to ban Pison Lee. And this was pre-independence, okay? Pison Lee were men wearing women's nighty, right? Covered with menstrual pads, <laughs> no underwear, <laughs> chasing people with sticks and beating them, right? And um, yes, piss on Lee. Um, I just kept wondering, could there be a connection between piss on bed and piss on Lee? Up to now, I really don't know. One day, researching Cersei and then something else, I came upon a custom in Ghana. A number of the cultural groups do it when a child who is six or seven or eight is still wetting their bed. What do we do here? What did we do when the child is wetting their bed? Anybody remember? <laughs> Any story? Sour sup. Sour sup stalk, yes. So that's the inner pith of the, the sour sup, right? You gave it to the child as a meal, right? Anything else? Piss a bed, piss a bed, cry for shame. Dog and all gonna know your name. Right? Many years ago, one of my aunts was sent to the shop to buy bread in Old Road. And coming home, she saw her uncle taking a younger aunt out into the road in her wet nighty, right? About to perform piss a bed, piss a bed on her. So she called mother, our grandmother, and that put an end to that. What they would do in the village, and I used to wet my bed. I used to wet my bed, and my uncles used to terrify me with this story. They would put a panny around your neck, a tin, as a makeshift drum, and they'd get your friends and the other village children to come along and beat a rhythm on the drum, Piss a bed, piss a bed, cry for shame. Dog and pussy go call your name. And then there'd be a dog attached to you by a rope. They say, dog and all go know your name. They hit the dog and the dog say, eh, eh. <laughs> And to my surprise, a number of cultures in Ghana have traditions just like this. Right? Right? So, I, I wondered sometimes, no. Of all the things to make it intact through slavery, right, and colonialism, it had to be piss a bed, piss a bed to terrorize me when I was little. <laughs> no, they couldn't remember the Afro comb, right? My mother was trying to comb my hair, and my aunt's breaking these combs in my hair and telling me I am nasty because my African hair is breaking the comb, right? The ancient Egyptians had the Afro comb 5,000 years ago. And nobody could remember to bring that from Africa, but they remember Pisabet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I read a, a piece where uh, a psychologist was saying that some children never really quite recover from it socially. Um, uh, well, they didn't track them through the adulthood, but it, it must be, have been an embarrassment. And now let me, let me take you through one of the uh, interesting versions. The child, the child was um, taken up in their bedclothes, thinning nettles, right, or something, maybe something scratchy like this, were put around their necks, and the parents had prearranged for their ch friends to chant this behind them, and Dwansi Krobo, Dwansi Krobo, which means piss a bed in, in a shanty. And down to the river or to the sea, where the child would be washed, tossed back in several times. And then on the last time, everybody would run away. And the piss a bed would chase them up the beach. And the person who he could whack or hit would become a piss a bed. And the, and, the, um, and the curse of being a piss a bed would leave you. Right? If it didn't work, they'd do it again. 
<laughs> a few days later. But then it occurred to me, I said, I wonder, I wonder if the Trinidad piss on Lee could be the spirit of that child chasing you in its wet nighty. I don't know. I don't certainly need some work. Okay? And that's for you archive lovers. I don't like archives. Right? I like to talk to old people. I like to talk to Sir Keith Lynn and the others about these things and to walk around in the bush. So archive lovers, please find out about that. Okay. And then in um, closing the chapter on the, um, the Ashanti and their, their near neighbors, or the Akan people, the Fanti, right, um, and so on, um, I wanted to just mention a couple of, um, of one fruit. Anybody have an idea what this fruit is? Little berries, little berries. Clammy cherry, you think it's clammy cherry? It's not clammy cherry, I fooled you. Okay. This, this is very spiky. There are spines underneath, underneath the leaf. What does the leaf look like? What vegetable? It looks like eggplant, right? This is wild choba. Wild choba. And what we, we know about wild choba in Antigua is wild choba will poison you, right? Fair enough. It's a solanum and it contains poisons like deadly nightshade. Number of people have tried to drink it or smoke it to get high, right? and they got really high because they didn't come back. Right? Right? And here is an interesting point. Ntorowa, Ntorowa, Choba. Ntorowa is the Ashanti and Fanti name for eggplant, garden egg, right? And we get Ntorowa from, from that. The, um, the Surinamese may pronounce it closer to Ntorowa, right? So sometimes you see in the botanical books the truba for this plant and the wild truba, right? So it's not only an Antiguan thing. So, fungi saltfish and fat. Nothing sweeter than that. If you want some taste like sweeter, pick an egg or clap the choba pan top. <laughs> okay? And the, the fruits of this plant, very bitter. Um, in Ghana, this plant is not choba because choba would be the garden egg. This plant is a version of choba called nsusua. Nsusua. Translated into Jamaica as susumba. Susumba. This is susumba, which uh, is a traditional food that the Jamaicans will have with saltfish. Right? This they would use instead of chop up. Right? Nice and bitter. And um, with the ackee and the saltfish. Right? So on special days, if you can still afford saltfish, this is what you would have with it. And um, Jamaicans say that Haitians are afraid of us. Why? Haitians are afraid of us because we eat susumba. And according to Jamaicans, susumba has magical properties in Haitian ritual. So when a Haitian sees a Jamaican eat the susumba, the Haitian is supposed to fall down in awe. Now, I never heard a Haitian say this. I only hear Jamaicans say, don't bother with them. We have our susumba. Right? Um, there is actually a story I saw in the newspaper about the earthquake in Haiti. And they said that a general from Jamaica actually brought order by taking some susumba out of his pocket and eating it in front of the, rebel, the rioters. And the rioting stopped. Right? <laughs> I, I don't know if that could be true. <laughs> All right. So how is it going? It, okay, good. One of the messages I'd like you to take home is an understanding of the depth of knowledge right, that 
those millions and millions and millions of wretched Africans brought with them here. People looked at them and saw them as muscle, but they brought knowledge, and they used that knowledge to build and change this side of the world. Now, this idea has been growing with historians for a while. Normally, normally, we hear about the African contributions to music. We hear about masquerade and dance. <coughs> we have our carnivals. We hear about religion, voodoo, right? candomblé down in Brazil, Santeria, and um, other Afro-Cuban religions like Palo Monte. Right? And um, what, what we seldom hear about is the African knowledge that was brought over in terms of science and engineering. But that's changing too. We're beginning to understand that Africans brought a lot of metallurgy. And this has been expressed, for example, in that new museum of um, the African diaspora which um, President Obama opened. That the outside of that museum is covered with intricate uh, ironwork, you know, like on your gate and so on, um, representing the iron ironwork skills that Africans brought into the new world. Construction techniques also. Um, herders. Some people in Africa are herders all their lives. And some of those herding techniques were brought over here. And eventually the freed Africans <coughs> made up a huge quantity of the cowboys. But we don't see that in the movies. Right? Cowboy work was terrible work. And the poorest people did it. So um, that's changing. One of the areas in which there's been little acknowledgement was the massive contributions that Africans made to agriculture. Right? And I won't go too, deep in, too deeply into it. But the first people who started to plant rice in the Americas seem to have been the Africans. They seem to have come on ships which were provisioned with rice. And then they took some of that rice and started to grow it in their own small holdings. There are stories among the Maroons of women who fled into the bush from the, the master's plantations in Suriname and Guyana carrying rice in their hair. And so there's that special place of women in, in, the, in the transmission of agricultural knowledge uh, to the Maroons. There's, um, there's uh, stories about Nanny of the Maroons and how she took magical pumpkin seeds out of her pockets when the people were in trouble and scattered them and how they sprouted overnight and the armies were fed with pumpkins the next morning. Right? Black-eyed peas, uh, uh, the president of the United States, Jefferson, saw his Africans growing black-eyed peas and he turned them into a plantation crop and has crop records. We talk about um, indigo, the blue dye, indigo. And the very first person to be recognized as an agricultural scientist in the United States, um, her name will come to me in a minute, no, no, not George Washington Carver, uh, a white lady. She, sorry? Yes, yes. Elizabeth, yes. Yes, born in Antigua of Antiguan parents, thanks, Doc. And, um, um, and uh, they, where they moved to the newly formed um, Carolinas colony. Um, and her father, her father um, came back to Antigua to to re resume his post. She married Pickney and stayed there. And uh, when she died, George Washington carried her coffin because of the contributions that she'd made to United States agricultural experimentation. Here in Antigua, and when she arrived in the Carolinas, she worked with her Africans, residents, her Africans, to develop um, the indigo processing from are based on original, traditional African knowledge, among other things, right? So when the Africans arrived, they didn't come just as brute force, right? They came with all sorts of knowledge which changed the place. Coming off of a boat, an African 
would have looked around at the plants and he would have recognized some right away. She would have recognized some right away. In particular, she would have recognized some things. So a new European would have been waxing lyrical about the parrots and paradise and maybe the African would have been saying, oh, oh I see the plant that I'm going to, to poison you with, right? But um, they gave African names to some of the plants and then they gave other, other names like, hey, I remember this from Congo. This plant here we call Congolala, okay? Congolala. And um, uh, it, uh, it has a number of medicinal uses. It's supposed to be great for, for, um, for hair as well, uh, keeping the color of your hair. This is, also, this is called the Congo cane sometimes, okay? Um, we have other plants like Congo pump. And uh, these, these seem, seem to be reminiscences of Africa. What time is it, please? Five to eight, okay. And um, um, this one I want to spend a little bit of time on because of its importance in some, of the, the, some parts of the Caribbean. Right? Uh, a very, very large number of Africans were brought from West Central Africa, countries which are now Gabon, Angola, Congo, and uh, the other Congo. Um, and that vast area, <coughs> which, uh, which, which um, it, it should never have been considered a country, uh, all the people who were brought from there were sort of branded as Congos. They spoke the language from which we get words like Fungi, Jumbi, Kunumunu. Right? What's a Kunumunu? A Kunumunu is a Kunumunu. <laughs> a Kunumunu is, 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 is a gentleman that's not very smart who is easily misled by women led astray, and so on and so forth, right? Um, a mumu, and some of those other words. Now, um, I, I won't go into why they're all called Congos, but the Congo um, kingdom was very influential in the area. One of the insignia of the Congo king was a plant called the spiral ginger. See how it's spiraling? Now, this is not the Congo spiral ginger. This is the one that grows over here. Guess what? Some of the Africans arriving over here give it the same name. They call it Nsangulavu in, in Congo. And over here they call it Sangrafu. And if you go to Suriname, they will tell you Sangrafu is the first plant that God created. Sangrafu is the father of all plants. Sangrafu must be in every medicine. Brazilian religions, Cuban religion and so on also in include um, uses for this plant. Um, it can be chewed, it's juicy, um, versions of it. There's some five different species in South America. And it's said that when the Maroons were running, the soldiers were after them, the soldiers were thirsty for water, the Maroons were chewing Sangrafu. Right? So Sangrafu remained potent um, in their culture. Back in Congo, it was a staff of office. On the initiation of a new king, right, a sangrafu might be tied around his waist while he's being given the spiritual bath. One sangrafu was planted on top of the, the um, we, could say, we could call it the grave of the last king. And if it caught and sprouted, yes, we had the right king. But if the dead king didn't approve, the sangrafu wouldn't grow. Right? I'm told that when um, Surinamese and people in Cayenne go out to hunt for herbs in the forest, they first look for Sangrafu. And then when they see that the area has been blessed by Sangrafu, it's around them that they collect their other herbs. Um, the, the wonderful nature of Sangrafu, we could go on forever about it, but I just wanted to mention it at this time. The, 
Um, Trinidadians call it River Cane or Congo Cane, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Can Congo. Okay? So there it is, Sangra Fu. For my last plant, for my last plant, um, I want to look at this um, one over here in the uh, in the bath. Look at this stupid-looking grass. Right? What can this grass be useful for? Right? Um, one of yeah. see it. It has this tassel at the top with five talons, which looks something like a fowl's foot. So one of the names is fowl foot grass, right? The French people would call it pied pull. Pied, the foot, pull, fowl, right? So Trinis, Lucians, um, and going, going windward from Guadeloupe would call it pied pull, fowl foot grass, right? And the fowl foot grass, can be used for a number of things. In Antigua, when somebody died, foul foot grass, we call it Dutch grass, or hard grass, or iron grass, or man grass, right? or dead grass. And when you died and you were laid out for a few hours before burial, what happened next? Somebody ran into the yard, dug up a spadeful of Dutch grass or dead grass with the dirt. Yes? And then they'd put this on your chest or on your belly. <sighs> Couldn't understand it. Why do you put it on the belly? Hold down the belly. Okay. Why do you put it on the belly, ma'am? Right? Keep it from rising. Preserve the dead. Right? So my chemistry friends are saying, let's see. Sometimes the plant contains some cyanides. Maybe those cyanides help to kill the bacteria. Right? No. My friend in France is trying to figure out whether um, whether the scientific one of the scientific names refers to Egypt. Everybody is speculating, why would we put it on the dead? Um, I looked and looked and looked and looked and thought, maybe the Ashanti might know. The Ashanti don't know. Spoken to many Ashantis. I've spoken to chiefs. Nope. They use it for different reasons, but they do not put it onto the chest of the dead. And then one day, I was very fortunate to, to learn that in the Congo, when somebody died, right, to make sure that the Jumbi didn't change its mind or that they didn't get, get up again. <laughs> they put a grass on him named Kimba Kimbanzia. Plural, Bimbanzia. Now, this is a blessed grass. You look into the background of Kimbanzia, it's a wonderful grass. God Nzambi, God Almighty Nzambi Mpungu, God's head is vast and God is clear and his head is covered not by hair but by Kim Bim Bam Bim Banzia. That means that God is picky head. <laughs> and um, when you seal a deal, you chew and spit out Kim Banzia. When somebody dies and you had been fighting with them, you get some kimbanzia and you rush to where they were buried and ask permission. You chew it. You spit it if you're a Kikongo. And having done that, you are able to speak to the dead and say, Chief, boss, me no mean, mean it, you know. Right? It was only words. I'm sorry. Right? Kimbanzia seals the deal. It was, in, it was illegal in the 1930s to dig up Kimbanzia from the marketplace. In Cuba, it's still called Kimbansa. In Brazil, it's still called Kimbansa. And in Antigua, we still put it on the bodies, not as a 
preserving chemical, but to preserve the dead, dead. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>